Jody Raybould releases a damning phone call about SNC, Nova Scotia changes their policy on organ donation, and Bitcoin begins to surge. I'm Marco Perry, welcome to the Perry Platform. It feels like we just can't get enough of SNC. It's been in the news nonstop pretty much for months now. And the crazy thing is, it just keeps getting better and better. The latest details released include things like Trudeau banishing Jody Raybould from the Liberal caucus and Jody Raybould releasing a phone call, a private conversation that she had with one of Trudeau's lackeys. So let's start from the top because it's a pretty big story with a lot of small details in it. The headlines today were reading, Trudeau expels Raybould, who was the former attorney general, the person who blew off the lid on the whole SNC scandal, and Philpot, you could call her a ruckus causer. She was basically in cooperation with Raybould, denouncing the Trudeau government for their approach towards SNC, and now they're basically <laughs> removed from the Liberal caucus and they can't run as candidates in the next election under the Liberal banner. This happened for a couple of reasons, and it's all in relation to SNC. So let's start with Trudeau's take on the situation and the reasons he used to justify his decision. The first one was he felt like these guys were not contributing to the Liberal Party anymore. And you can kind of see where he's coming from with that. So Jody Raybould and Philpott were repeatedly saying that they lost trust in the Liberal government. They handled the entire operation incorrectly. There's some corruption running deep. And the Liberals were feeling attacked by this. A lot of them felt like they couldn't cooperate with these individuals anymore. And funny enough, the government started saying that they lost trust in them. So I guess they both lost trust in each other. There's mutually no trust to be had. They're acting like adversaries now. So he felt for the good of the party, it was better to remove them and try to extract some of the chaos causing elements in that equation. The second reason, which has a lot of merit to it actually, is the fact that Jody Raybould taped a private conversation with the clerk of the Privy Council, Wernick, who reports to Trudeau, and she later exposed the entire phone conversation online. I'm going to get more into the phone call in just a little bit because that itself is a story alone. But getting back to Trudeau's statement, he said that these guys were essentially giving ammunition to the opposition parties, which is true. They were giving basically all the tools they needed to dismantle the Liberal Party. As you can see from the latest polling data, they are in shambles right now. And he's saying that they, pre they presented the notion that the Liberal Party is divided, which he's changed his tone, actually. If you guys were following his takes on the situation, he was repeatedly saying how the Liberal government is stronger than ever, whatever, magical fairy dust and pixie wonder. But now he's finally waking up and realizing the gravity of the situation. They're actually going through turmoil right now. The party is divided and the opposition has a lot of firepower they can use to leverage in the next election. It's not looking good for the Liberals. And he felt like these two individuals were perpetuating the issue and making it worse for everyone there. He then goes on to say civil wars are damaging because it signals to Canadians we care more about ourselves than we do about them. First of all, this quote's so funny to me because I started picturing the Avengers Civil War. You have Iron Man versus Raybould, who I guess would be Captain America, and they can't agree on something, so now they're having a clash. The second thing that I found hilarious about this statement is that fundamentally, I don't believe it's true. It, it, he's playing it off as an absolute, that civil wars among the party are representative of them caring about themselves instead of caring about the Canadian citizens as a whole. But that may be true in some instances. Certain civil wars are definitely fought for self-preservation among the caucuses, but it's not always like that. And I feel like this situation is an example of something that's not like that. So Jody Raybould pulled up the curtains on the entire controversy, and she's received a lot of backlash for it. Things aren't going her well her way per se. She's been removed from the Liberal caucus, she's lost her position, and a lot of bad things are going towards her. The same can be said about Philpot. She's been removed as well. And if all they were worried about was self-preservation, to me it seems like they would have been more inclined to just follow along with Trudeau's proposition. The Liberal Party would still be looking good in the polls, they would have their positions, and they'd be poised to win again in the next election. But it seems to me the entire situation is something different at its core. They decided to stand up for something that they felt was wrong. They may have had some type of personal vendettas or something that may have motivated them towards taking this course of action but to say it was purely out of a need for their personal development or however else Trudeau is trying to frame it I feel like it's not entirely representative of the situation as a whole. So now we get to the juicy details of the story. 
Raybolt's phone call. She basically tried to play Inspector Gadget and she put a bug on the phone call and she recorded an entire conversation with the clerk of the Privy Council, Wernick. As I said, he reports directly to Trudeau. So it was a pretty lengthy phone call. I believe it was about 14 minutes. And like one of the key takeaways of the phone call that people are really reporting on was Wernick literally tells her that Trudeau is firm on his stance to have the federal prosecution overruled and he would rather them settle outside of court. So there's a lot of back and forth in the phone call. Jody Raybould is saying stuff along the lines of, I don't believe this is right. And Wernick is telling her, oh, I think you should just reconsider. Look at all the options. We're in favor of this one in particular over here. Jody basically released this phone call to give people proof of exactly what happened. And it does fall in line with her claims that they were persistent in their suggestions, that they really wanted a certain outcome. She seemed to not be willing to give it to them. And as a result, there were certain pressures that were applied. But there's a couple of things to take into consideration about the way this was set up. The first is you have to be extremely careful with the way you interpret the way the phone call played out. Because for starters, Jody Raybald was the one who recorded the phone call. So she knew it was going to be happening like this. And she knew full well that there was the possibility that this phone call would be later leaked and released to the public. So the thing she said may have not been entirely in line with how she felt or what she was thinking. But Wernick didn't have that same benefit. He was completely unaware that this was being recorded. So he was speaking truthfully. And we can assume that this is how a typical official in the government speaks. Raybould, though, had the advantage of foresight. She knew it was going to be leaked. So it's hard to tell exactly whether or not if she was acting out of intelligent design or if she genuinely felt this. Because if I knew that a phone call I was having with someone was being recorded and I could use it as proof later, I would try to frame myself to look as innocent as possible and try to make the other person look as guilty to skew the results in my favor. Obviously, that's wrong. So we have to take this with a grain of salt. The one thing we know for sure, though, is that Wernick's position was exposed and it's it's in line, as I say, with what she's testified. So it really wasn't anything new per se. It was just an extra layer of evidence that was put forward. So my second point about the voice recording, it, it relates back to Trudeau's comment about trust. And here's where I agree with him. They did breach that trust within the government, within party lines even, among the Liberal Party members. She secretly recorded this phone call. And let's digress a little bit. So recording phone calls within government is extremely dangerous. It's a double-edged sword. So in this case, you could say it worked out because there wasn't any national secrets or anything too, too damning in the phone call. And when it was released, it was more so a confirmation. People already knew about a lot of the stuff that was happening. And this just confirmed Raybould's story. There wasn't any like bombshells in the conversation, but this could have taken a drastic turn and even think of a different context to be recording phone calls of government ministers can go extremely wrong. Let's say we're talking about national secrets, something that is kept confidential for a reason. XXX classified. <laughs> that sounds dirty. Actually, I take that back. So let's just say classified files. Those things, they're kept private for a lot of reasons. And some of them is to protect citizens. Some of it is to keep it away from foreign governments. So the fact that she was willing to take this, I will call a rather radical approach to things, indicates to me how desperate she was to get this out. Because traditionally, I would agree, it was definitely a breach of trust to be doing this. And it might even be bordering on illegal, depending on what was exposed. If it was something completely like insane that she put out there, it could be tried as treason. So it's not an example to be followed in the future, especially when dealing with government intel. It's a very dangerous game she's playing here. Then you have on the other hand that citizens would like to know what exactly is happening in government. And sometimes it's hard to tell because all we hear is the aftermath or the stories that come out post event. This was actually a live look at a real conversation between two high ranking government officials. It gave us a real insight into the way things work and how these discussions go down. Like if we waited for the press conference, there would be a lot of he said, she said, we wouldn't know the facts, but this was evidence that came out. So I can definitely feel that argument, but it's a balancing act. You have to be extremely careful when doing stuff like this. And now you begin to wonder if Jody Raybould will ever be able to hold a successful conversation with anyone in the government again because of what she's done here. She set a negative precedent that she's willing to cross over these boundaries and record people without their knowledge and even post it later. So... Now, whenever you're in a phone call with her, you might not be willing to speak about certain things and that's going to complicate her relationship with a bunch of people, even within her own party. 
So now you begin to wonder how effective she can be in a role if she is reinstated into the government. A lot of negative consequences come as a result of what she's done here, but at least the truth was revealed to a certain extent. It's, it's hard for me to formulate how to feel about this because I can see the positives and the negatives of doing something so radical. So one thing we can conclude after hearing everything is that people who didn't believe her per se before, the call adds extra evidence to her claims and now there is further pressure being applied to the liberal governments and things just keep getting worse and worse for them. It's almost spiraling out of control right now. Today, the other parties were astonished at what happened here and they let their opinions be heard. So essentially, they shifted the discussion to what should you do to a government whistleblower because that's what Jody Raybould's being framed as now. She blew the whistle on government corruption and what happens if you do that? Do you end up losing your position and being expelled from your home party, such as what really happened today? Or should you be protected? The NDP and the Conservatives united and they essentially said that Trudeau's approach to the situation was shameful. It was dishonorable that he is expelling a person who was just trying to inform the Canadian populace about what's happening in the government and it's not the right way to be treating whistleblowers because it discourages them from blowing the whistle. As I've said before, if they were concerned with self-preservation, it may not have been wise to go down this path because now they've incurred a lot of negative responses. They are basically banished from running under the liberal flag again and they've lost their position. So is that how you want your whistleblowers to be treated? Maybe there's another whistleblower out there who's about to blow another bombshell and they see what's happening here. What if they're more concerned about their personal well-being? They still want to let you know the truth, but they're now willing to risk their job and their future like this. So it's it's difficult. It's really a difficult decision to be making. But you know what's easy? It's easy to be judging like what the NDP and the conservatives are doing. Obviously, they can say with absolute ease that, oh, you know what? What I would do is I would protect these whistleblowers. Well, if they were the ones who were shrouded in controversy, it might not go down that way. It's one thing to say it and another to actually act on what you're talking about and transform it into action. And I'm not really too sure if I believe they would take that same route. So the one thing I conclude with absolute certainty though is removing the other elements of the equation. It's definitely not the correct way to be treating a whistleblower. We have to respect that. As I've said before, we are a lawful society and we need to protect people who are fighting a righteous battle in the name of justice. She felt like these things weren't supposed to be happening and she talked about it. If the government felt like she was wrong, there are ways to handle that through discussion. The only reason why it's escalated so far is because of the way it was mismanaged and not handled. And on top of that, there was some wrongdoing. It's very obvious on behalf of the liberal government. And that's why they're unable to fully defend themselves. So I have no doubt that the SNC situation has yet to reach its climax. It's still getting up there. Almost every day there's a new headline in relation to the situation. And join us next time on SNC Endgame as we keep you up to date with all the latest. There's no Infinity Stones though. It's just Trudeau fighting with his ministers. So let's move on to a, another headline today. And that was Nova Scotia became the first nation in North America to change their organ donation policies. It shifted to something called a presumed consent system. So just a little bit of background. Organs are a vital part of our healthcare system. There are a bunch of patients who suffer health complications that require them to get a replacement, kidney, liver, lung, even sometimes heart, things like this. And a lot of these organs come from people who have recently been killed. They recently joined the deceased. And what happens is they'll be taken to a hospital, transported. Once they've been labeled as deceased, they'll look at their consent forms. And if they have checked yes, which means they've opted in to the consent to have their organs harvested, the doctors will remove them and store them. And when there are people or patients who need these organs, they will be given to them. So that's kind of how the current system works. You have to opt into it. Usually when you get your driver's license, they'll give you a form with a square box. It will say you want to opt in to organ donation and you will say yes if you do, or if you don't, you'll just leave it alone and not fill anything in. Now they're changing the system to basically reverse the process where you have to fill out a form if you want to opt out of organ donation. They want to presume consent which is to say when you die, they're automatically going to assume that you are willing to have your organs harvested. And really, my, my only real beef with this is the usage of that term, presumed consent. Like that would be pretty controversial in any other context. You would like to reaffirm 
that an individual has in fact given you permission to do something before you do it. It's not really consent if it's automatic. Like the term automatic consent, what's that mean? It's essentially saying the same as without consent. If you don't say this, this is what we're going to assume. There's no real semblance of consent in that equation at all. It's really a euphemism to try to make you feel better about the change. A couple of benefits that the lawmakers hope to extract from this change is, first of all, addressing the shortage of vital organs. There is numerous patients across the country, and they have to deal with extremely long wait times because sometimes the organs they need are simply not available. And on top of that, an issue they're trying to combat is the fact that a lot of Canadians were really indifferent about it and they really just didn't care. Some of them were so lazy that they didn't even bother to take the extra step of checking off the box to consent to organ donation because it required that much work. People want to take the path of least resistance. So now they've switched the equation to make the path of least resistance becoming an organ donor and now it requires work for you to opt out. So basically the exact same thing but due to this minor change and people's general tendency to be indifferent to the organ donation aspect, they expect a massive increase in the supply of these organs and it'll help a lot of people. So obviously it has a lot of positive effects to it. There's only one situation where I would feel this could backfire, but as long it's only a minor situation and it's unlikely to happen. But as long as we talk about it and it's controlled for, it should be fine. So obviously the supply of organs should increase but the thing with these organs and harvesting them is your organs are better in terms of value and the health of them the sooner they're extracted from your point of death so if they've been inside a dead body for a long time they start to degrade as well there is an incentive to get them out of you as soon as possible and usually that happens as soon as you die the first thing that these doctors want to do when you're declared dead is deal with the organs because they want to take them out in the best shape possible so i believe that the individual has the right and deserves the best possible care that they can get even if their odds of survival are extremely low so here comes an issue like let's say a doctor starts to do a mental trade-off analysis because there's a patient with an extremely low rate of survival let's say it's like sub one percent or even one percent it's very likely they're going to die and the doctor is now doing the trade-off because do we waste resources and potentially risk having the organs fail and enter failure states where they're less valuable to us? Or do we just pull the plug early, cut our losses, let the person die without even trying that much and extract the organs because we want them healthier and they can help someone in the future. So that's a very controversial thing that could happen. Everything should be done to help them. And once they have fully passed, after you've done everything in your power to save them, then they can be harvested. Cutting corners because now there's an incentive that most people will have for their death essentially it's, it could backfire, and the only way that this can be tackled is to make sure that doctors don't get this mindset and to make sure that there are strict implications and rules in place to make sure it doesn't occur. As long as it's controlled for, and this change is generally good. It will help people who need organs, and it will take care of those who are waiting right now with enormous long wait times to get these surgeries done. So as I said, Nova Scotia is the only place in all of North America with this new rule. I fully expect other provinces or even cities abroad to start looking at their organ donation plans and I feel like they will follow suit. It's a fairly logical proposition to be making and there are definitely benefits to it. So now moving on to our final story, Bitcoin. Yes, that crazy thing starts to surge. In the past month, Bitcoin's value has gone up by 39% and these are really massive gains to be having in such a short amount of time. In the financial markets, a 39% gain in a month would be obscene. That would get you a hefty bonus with whoever's portfolio you're managing. The price has gone up to around $5,000, and this is in US. It was at roughly $3,000 before the surge. Still, this is nowhere near its pinnacle. About two years ago, Bitcoin was hitting $20,000, and people were freaking out. Now, the FOMO effect was in full swing. Everyone wanted a piece, and it started crashing. Bitcoin's been in decline for basically the past two years. Like since it hit that $20,000, it's been a steady drop. Anyone who invested in Bitcoin at that point has felt pretty bad. And that's where all these hold memes come into effect is hold on to your Bitcoin. Eventually the price might go up. So there's a lot of people who are happy now. Uh, it seems like it's on the trend again. It's almost unpredictable when this is going to happen. The Bitcoin and even the cryptocurrency markets are extremely volatile. And that basically leads to amplified risks. But at the same time, 
your rewards can be massive as well. Look at this. In just one month, your whole portfolio could have gone up 39%. And there was a time when I was following this cryptocurrency. It was called Ripple. I had my eyes on it when it was about, I believe it was three cents a coin. And during the summer is when Bitcoin was reaching $20,000. Ripple reached $3 per coin. That's, that's obscene. If you bought a bunch of coins at three cents and you held them to that $3 price point, the amount, of, oh my, the amount of money you would have made is insane. If you invested $1,000, you would have had $100,000. If you put in $10,000, you would have been a millionaire. Like how crazy is that? The gains are all there, but conversely, it can crash the next day because there's no real regulations in the crypto market. It's basically the wild west of investing. And right now, times are looking good, but who knows what's going to happen. The very next day, it could fall to a dollar. Bitcoin is trying to break its way into popular currency demands, but it's been a struggle. And a lot of the other cryptos are fighting for relevance as well. We'll see how it plays out. I do believe blockchain could be the tool of the future. But this recent surge has been uplifting to a lot of people who have invested in Bitcoin and hopefully it gets their conversation started up again because Bitcoin was the topic a little while ago and it kind of fell off, but now it's on its way back up. So who knows how it's going to play out. Maybe we'll see a bunch of millionaires tomorrow if Bitcoin goes back up to $20,000. So that about does it for today. I'm Marco Perry. Thanks for joining me on the Perry platform. I'll see you soon.